Chris Johnson, who is uh, going to be leading our discussion today. He is our speaker. He is the pastor at First Baptist Church of San Antonio. Uh, Dr. Chris Johnson got his Doctor of Ministry degree here at Truett Seminary. And uh, somebody the other day told me his dissertation was very exciting. They went up to the third floor and read it all in one sitting. So if you want to know more about his um, uh, dissertation, uh, Beyond today, you can go up to the third floor and um, and know this. And, I, and also, Chris Johnson is a San Antonio Spurs fan, as am I. So you know he's a good guy. And I think it's providential that, uh, Chris, that you're in San Antonio right now, because I think the Spurs might need a little bit of corporate discernment. Um, so <laughs> but uh, we are so excited to uh, have Chris up here. He's uh, a friend and a brother in Christ, and so... We hope that uh, together we can make the most of our time through uh, the discussion as well. So welcome, and um, now we will sing and worship God through, um, through song. Well, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Uh, I wanted to say, too, by way of personal introduction, um, my wife and I were in Waco 17 years, uh, came to Baylor, uh, and stayed because we, we loved Waco. Uh, Waco was our home. Both of our daughters were born here. Um, and so it's special to me to be back and to be back here with you. Um, it means the world to me. A year ago, we moved to San Antonio, and I, I miss this family. Um, I miss each of you um, because I don't yet have those connections uh, in San Antonio that we had here at Truett, the WRBA, uh, in Waco. Um, and I, I long for that again, and, and I miss you dearly. Um, and I will say, I am a huge Spurs fan, but that doesn't make up for missing you. Um, <laughs> but I'm thankful to be in San Antonio, and I'm, I want to share with you today um, what I felt like was the most compelling um, and intriguing aspect uh, of my research. It's not the whole of it. Uh, but this is one part, I think it's probably the most important part and uh, the most compelling. So Tim, I think we can hit start and go here. Uh, corporate discernment is inside the church when we have a team or a committee or a group making a decision together. And often our decision making in the church can quickly turn into a secular type decision making if we're not careful. But we need to include God in our decision making. And when we include God in our decision making, in inevitably people will jump to passages like John 15, 7, where if we come together and we pray, God will give us whatever we wish. And so some of our people lean on this kind of faith and say, God, we're praying, so help us get there. When are we going to get what we ask for. Or we keep moving down through John 15 where others will look and say, when is God going to make known His will to us? Where Jesus said, you're, you're no longer slaves, you're my friend, and, you're, and I will make known to you the will of God. And so when is this going to happen for us? And some will just sit back and wait for this revelation of God. Or something like with Paul in Acts 16, where we read these stories of Scripture where Paul is supposed to be out on his missionary journeys and he's forbidden by the Holy Spirit. He's forbidden by the Spirit of Jesus, or he has this vision where he says, in this vision, a man just shows up to him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And so our committees that are making decisions together are longing for this kind of interaction with God. And is this possible within the church where we pray and get what we wish for? Or we're a friend with God like Moses was, or his Holy Spirit comes down and gives us a vision. How do we make that happen in our corporate discernment processes? Well, the ancient key is to repent. That if it's possible for us to have communication with God in these ways that we just saw, the key is repentance. Any movement, any revelation of God begins in your confession. And as I research this, Scripture overflows with this word and this concept. It comes up over and over again. You search the Old Testament, you go to the prophets, you, you go to Isaiah. You read, your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have caused God to hide His face from you. This is the calling to Israel saying, when you're praying to God, asking for what's next, and your prayers are hitting the ceiling and coming back down on top of you, 
the reason is because of your sin and how it separated you. Same thing, you move into Jeremiah, no man's repented of his wickedness. As a general rule, any sin is damning, and as a general rule, any sin cuts off communication with God, which undermines our discernment process. And so the only remedy to that is repentance. This carries all through the Old Testament, and then it carries over into the New Testament even stronger, where we get the, the work of Jesus early in the Gospels. You get his birth, his temptation. And then when Jesus starts his ministry, the first word of Jesus' ministry carries on John the Baptist's words to repent. The time is here. The kingdom of God's at hand. Repent. Uh, believe the gospel. Same thing, Paul, the apostles kept it going. The same word to repent. When Paul's before King Agrippa in Acts 26, and, and the king says, so what are you preaching? And Paul says, I'm going all over, and I preach the same thing to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Repent and turn to God, where you need to perform deeds appropriate to repentance. And then as we move beyond Scripture, St. Ignatius was helpful. In fact, he has a discernment process for clergy where they pray to God finding what's next. And in his process, the first thing that you do is confession. You get on your knees and you repent for a week. In fact, it's the first 25%. It's the most important 25%. There's nothing else that you do more in discernment than repentance. So when you, you look through this, you see these four pictures that as you repent, that's when the clarity comes. It begins to, the fuzziness goes away and you begin to see clearly as you take repentance seriously. And the opposite is also true. The longer it's been since you've repented, the murkier life becomes, the fuzzier life becomes. So what this means for the discernment process, that a group that's discerning an issue must take repentance seriously before they take the issue itself seriously. If they're not repentant, they're not going to hear of our God. All want an answer, and all want an answer from God, but often few want to do the hard work of repentance, uh, searching their own heart in confession. So let me work through with you how I do repentance myself. Every Monday morning, I do repentance. And I've also done this with groups, where I have a, a list, uh, two lists on a sheet of paper, one on either side. And as I work through these, in the middle, I write out my confession. So one of the lists that I have is Marjorie Thompson's from her book, Soul Feast. Now, these aren't necess necessarily sinful, but they're places and areas in our life where sin shows up. So when I'm doing confession, I mark one or two of those things that I'm dealing with personally every week, and I write out in the middle my confession and how these things have been affecting my life. Now, there's another list that I also use. Th use. This is the seven deadly sins that came out of medieval monasteries. And I found this most helpful. And so I do the same thing. As I'm praying through myself, doing confession, I circle one or two of these things that my heart is dealing with. And then I spell it all out and write it down completely in the middle of the page and hand it over to God. And then I destroy the page afterwards. And that's where we need a repentance warning. Now, when you have a group that's going through discernment, I would encourage you to lead them through repentance first. But be warned. Uh, if you're using those lists, they're not exhaustive. But also be warned that you've got to have privacy and so if you have anything written down, you need to destroy it. Um, but also, maybe this is the harshest or hardest warning, is if you haven't done repentance, it can be very emotional and painfully emotional. And so all of that leads to once, once we get everything out on the table and our hearts are repentant, we draw near to God. And practically, that's what's happening in repentance is we come closer to God and we're able to see clearly. And so you're close enough that if God speaks on the issue, you can hear it. Now, one more person, Ruth Haley Barton, there's one thought I took from her, where churches have a bad habit of putting people on a team just to get them involved in a church. So you take a banker and put them on the finance team. But that can completely de destroy the process of discernment because, as she argues, if you have one unrepentant heart on your team, it'll undermine the whole process of discernment. That repentance is more important than any technical knowledge which leads us to after repentance. So repentance is just the first step in the process of discernment. So repentance is first, and it, it, maybe it's the most important, but then you still have a whole process of discernment itself that you need to work through, where you're listening to God, listening to one another, you're doing your research, you're following through on the actual issue that you're dealing with, and then you're working through whatever technical knowledge there is on the issue that you have. But with, with all of that going on and all the other processes that follow, repentance always has to come first if you're going to hear a word from the Lord. And as we spoke of earlier, 
that repentance is more important than any of the technical knowledge. Uh, and in fact, uh, the technical knowledge is important, but it's going to be useless without unrepentant heart, or with unrepentant hearts moving forward in that discernment process. And I am out of time. Uh, thank you, uh, Emmanuel. Thank you, Chris. You'll notice on your uh, table, you have a small handout that looks like this. We're going to take uh, a couple of minutes just to discuss those uh, right where you are around your table. And after a couple of minutes, I'll come back up and invite Chris to come forward again so that um, we can ask him those our questions. Thanks. All right, we'll go ahead and wrap up our discussion time uh, at this time, and I'll ask Chris to come forward at this time and take the platform. And so you all are free at this time to ask any question uh, you'd like of Chris. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Could you give the name of the book and the plain name that you uh, uh -huh. So the Marjorie Thompson's book called Soul Feast. Um, and she has it, what she calls your examination of life. She doesn't talk about it in terms of repentance, but that's the way I use it, um, where she says these are areas of your life you need to examine. And so fears, faith, sexuality, social acceptance, material security, and emotional security. So those six things are places in your life where sin sh can show up. And so I kind of work through those. Okay, well, let's see. Yeah, so that's our book, Soul Feast. Um, and so, like I said, every Monday morning, I look through these two lists and see where sin is showing up in my life and just sort of have that in confession. Um, and so I do use that one, but honestly, the one that's more helpful for me uh, is the list of the seven deadly sins. Um, Jeff? While people are thinking, could you perhaps give, we, we had the advantage of having you at our table. Could you perhaps sketch what you did So in the pro in my project at Chalk Bluff, how this worked. So I had uh, different committees that were making major decisions, and as they were making their major decisions, we wanted to make sure that we were covering the spiritual component of the decisions and not just have some uh, secular business type decision making model. And so what I had them do was, if they're spending an hour um, working through a, a decision, they had to spend half of that time in some kind of spiritual practice that they were doing. So, um, and I had a bunch of different things that they did. One of them was confession. The first was confession. So that w in their first meetings, what they would do is if they had an hour meeting, the first 30 minutes was spent in confession. Now confession is not one they did together. They broke up, did that on their own and came back. Um, but so they would spend 30 minutes doing that or doing worship and then 30 minutes discussing the issue. And so the thought process in the project was if, if we spend half of the time in these spiritual uh, exercises and half of the time working through the issue itself how would God speak or how would that change our perception uh, of that decision making process if that's the way we were doing it and so there were varying results but good results uh, with that so one of the things that you run into resistance wise is, is Jeff was pointing this out earlier that um, this takes, this is a huge commitment, right? Asking somebody to be on your, your finance committee where they go through the budget once a month or something like that, it's not that big of a commitment. But if you're asking them to be spiritually prepared to make big decisions uh, through a finance committee or something like that, and they have to work through a larger discernment process, that's, that's a huge ask that most people are not used to in our churches, although maybe they should be. And so, but another part of that ask is this um, extends the time commitment. So essentially the way people look at this, so if you're, you're saying, if you're telling a, a team, so let's take a, a search committee searching for a minister, that they're gonna have to spend half their time in, in worship together. Uh, a lot of them hear it, well, that means it's gonna double the time of our meetings. Um, it, it's, it's gonna make it uh, a lot more inefficient where we're gonna have a two hour meeting instead of a one hour meeting. And so what you have to do is, is help them understand um, the extra time at the front end, it's actually going to give them the strength and the wisdom 
to, to pursue that further. So really a lot of it is thinking through the time commitment and the spiritual commitment of what this means um, to, to do this in the church. Yeah. Other, other questions? Uh, I mean, that's a good question. Probably a, a year or so. Oh, it, the, the question was, how did you or how long did you work through this personally before sharing with it, this with the church? And so it's about a year. Um, and then there's kind of an ongoing thing with that where and to do this well, I'm talking about confession and repentance in particular. Um, to do this well, it's more than just preaching uh, this thread of repentance that's all through Scripture. But you have to practice it yourself and work through how you do it yourself and then sort of teach the practical side of this and give them practical things. That's why I showed you the two lists that I gave you and told you every Monday morning I take these two lists and this is how I do confession. Um, and then with these groups and then now in my new role in San Antonio, I'm doing this with, with many groups too where I hand out this paper and say if, if we're going to be doing this together, you need to do confession and let me give you a practical way to do it. You go home and you practice this. So, and this is, like I said, this is not exhaustive and it's not, maybe not even the best way to do it. It's just the way I found that's been helpful for me. And so that I can at least share that with them. And so if you can find a, a rhythm and a practice of repentance that work, works for you, you can then teach them how to do it. And so it was fruitful for me to do it first and figure it out my own. Um, yeah, other questions? Yeah. So not, this was not a part of this project. So uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, now, scripturally, we do have this opportunity to confess to our brothers, right? And have that, and sisters. And to have that accountability where confession and repentance um, can be done in the group. With these groups, um, I didn't want to have that level of um, sort of, What's the word? Maybe tension, or I didn't want them to have to, to deal with that in the, in the committee, the people that may not have known each other real well. So I left confession just between them and God in this moment, where get, get it right between yourself and God first, then, then we can start sharing it among others. Because as I was saying, this can be, repentance, confession can be very emotional, um, and you have to be very trusting and have a deep trust with somebody to share what you write on those lists with, with your brother or sister that's with you. So I wasn't sure in these committees and in this project there was a deep enough trust to have that happen. Um, but that is biblical and hopefully should happen in the long term, right? Yeah. There was a discussion at our table about uh -huh. the Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you think the No, not... Yeah, I'm right. I know. Yeah. Well, I will tell you one of the things that came on my heart as I was working through this myself and reading through Scripture. So one of the things that I did, uh, I do do like a read through the Bible and the year plan. And one of the things I started doing was underlining in red uh, everywhere the word repentance or repent showed up, or, or the concept of repentance. You'd be amazed. It felt like every other page I was underlining in red all through the Scripture. Um, one of the things that I noticed as I practiced this myself and searched the scripture was how often corporate repentance shows up, the, the sins of the church. And so that's not something I've completely worked through myself, but I have started trying to use that language. And in fact, when we have prayer times in our church, um, we'll often include that in the repentance time. How, how and what do we need to repent of as a church? Or if, you, if you're looking over the, the history of Israel, uh, in the Old Testament is what do we need to repent of as a nation? Um, and so there may be places and room for that when we have our prayer times together at church. So uh, we have three different prayer times during the week. And most of the time, well, every time I'll do repentance, and most of the time I will ask those questions just to kind of get in that process. What do we need to repent of as a group, as a church? And what do we need to repent of um, as a city or a nation? Um, and lay before God. That's much easier to do in a corporate, uh, where people can kind of talk about that among themselves as opposed to our, our personal sins and sort of laying that out. Um, but that can be emotional too. In fact, one of the first times we talked about um, sort of corporate confession at First Baptist San Antonio, um, I got a lot of pushback. 
because people didn't want to think about it. Um, in fact, they were much more willing to pray privately about their own sins than talk openly about the sins of the church we might need to, to repent of. Um, but those can be just as damning, can't they? Yeah. Other, other things? A single sin will derail discernment. Uh, I put a lot of thought into that. Um, and as I said in, in my uh, talk, that um, that came from a, a lecturer, went and saw Ruth Haley Barton at Northern Seminary in, in Chicago. Um, and she kind of pressed in on that, talking about um, discernment. And she, she was really dealing with um, uh, non, uh, Christian nonprofit boards and how you do this on a Christian nonprofit board. Um, and, and she really kind of pushed that heavily, that if, you know, you, you, you have to get this right um, for your board to make good decisions. And so I think the answer to that is false, that God can overcome anything, um, but I think we need to heed it as a stern warning um, that, that really sin does derail our discernment um, a lot more than, than we give it credit for. Um, but with that said, our God is great. Um, and our God works uh, through a lot of failing, broken people, too. So I think it's probably false. If you put the word unrepentant after single, would that make it more true? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, because we talked about that at our table. If you have, so if you have someone, so you're doing this discernment process with a, with a team, and you have a, a, an unrepentant person on there, uh, that makes it probably a lot more true that you saying an unrepentant person um, may derail the group far more than maybe a single sin that might broaden it out a little bit, a little bit better. So yeah, that's probably a good word there. Yeah. Other other questions or comments? Uh, I mean, I gave you probably the two names. Let me think. Uh, Luke Timothy Johnson wrote a book uh, on this too. There's not a ton on corporate discernment. There's a, there's a lot on individual discernment. There's next to nothing on corporate discernment. Um, I said Luke Timothy Johnson, Ruth Haley Barton, the St. Ignatius. Um, I, but I will say, and I, I don't mean this to be a Sunday school answer uh, at all. I, mean, I sincerely, um, when I started reading through Scripture with a red pen, um, that was the most helpful by far on how deep this thread of repentance runs in scripture um, and how integral it is um, to who we are as believers um, we can't miss it um, so those are those are probably the main ones yeah. thank you appreciate it Absolutely.